our house looks a bit different than others on the block. Our yard is certified wildlife habitat by the National Wildlife Federation. That's because the front yard and backyard are landscaped with native plants and we've taken many other measures to support native birds and insects. There are islands filled with native plants and paths in between. We maintain over 100 species of native plants in our yard. It's been a lot of work. Several years ago, soon after we bought the property, it was mostly lawn. We replaced the lawn with raised beds for vegetables and other areas for native plants. The only lawn left is between the sidewalk and the street. Of course we provide nesting opportunities for birds. We have seed feeders with sunflower chips and a suet feeder to attract birds who won't eat seed. Many of our native plants greatly benefit pollinators, like this goldenrod. Some of the non-native plants, like this pear tree, are attractive to the native mason bee. We plant sunflowers because they are easy to grow and attract many seed eaters, like this red-breasted nuthatch. We also see black-capped chickadees visiting sunflowers and American goldfinches. In late summer or fall, we allow the seed heads of many native plants to remain standing as another food source for birds. Here is an American goldfinch eating self-heal seeds. Pine trees are also a source of seeds. Like many other bird lovers, we keep hummingbird feeders out all year long. That's because the Anna's hummingbirds stay here all winter. Anna's hummingbirds have expanded their range from California because humans have fed them and have planted non-native shrubs that flower in the winter. Some individuals, like this male Anna's hummingbird, aren't shy at all and can learn to trust you enough for very close encounters. Rufus hummingbirds return in March. We planted red flowering currants because we know that Rufus hummingbirds look for them during migration. Anna's hummingbirds enjoy the blossoms too. In addition to eating insects, orange crowned warblers will sip flower nectar. The yellow blossoms of twinberry are popular with the hummingbirds. Twinberry is a native species of honeysuckle that grows like a bush. It can bloom from spring and through the summer. Twinberry attracts native pollinators too. Hummingbirds visit most any other flower that produces nectar. We have a variety of trees and shrubs in the yard, and this attracts a comparable variety of birds who eat insects and fruit. The blossoms on this Sitka willow attract insects. Insectivorous birds like this yellow-rumped warbler spend time hunting in the willow. This bullock's oriole is hunting for bees. Our compost is full of insects and other invertebrates of all sizes. Bush tits often visit for tiny flies. In the summer months, when bluebirds are nesting, we take soldier fly larvae out of the compost and feed them to the bluebird family. In the winter, 
Ground-feeding birds like this very thrush glean for invertebrates. American robins find something to eat, too. Last year's rotten apples are a meal for this migrating western tanager. Cedar waxwings eat rotten apples and other fruits. Here they are eating berries from our neighbor's hawthorn. Twinberry fruits are occasionally eaten by cedar waxwings. We give cavity nesting birds as many choices as we can offer, but we don't expect full occupancy. The species we've had nest in our yard are western bluebird, violet green swallow, tree swallow, and black cap chickadee. We've been unsuccessful with other artificial nest types, even though the target species regularly visits our yard. Here's a wooden shelf designed to attract robins, doves, or finches, but we've never had any occupants. Here's a DIY plaster nest, painted to look like a barn swallow nest. When choosing a nest site, barn swallows often look for places with evidence of previous nesting, but the only interested creatures seem to be spiders. Here's a nest box designed to attract black-capped chickadees, which is supposed to resemble a white birch trunk, even though we had mounted it on the shady north side of the tree like we were supposed to, no chickadees have ever nested in it. Attracting nesting birds requires patience, trial, and error. It may take years to attract some species you hope to get. Sometimes other species may take your offer. It's a great idea to leave dead trees standing or mimic these natural nesting cavities. Someone in our neighborhood discarded this trunk from a dead birch tree and we took it home and installed it in our backyard. We've had black cap chickadees nest in it for a couple years. In the winter, a female downy woodpecker excavates her cozy little bedroom for cold winter nights, but she has yet to nest in there. We're not the most tidy of gardeners, but that's okay, because last year's plant stems are also a good source of nesting material. We couldn't talk about cavity nesters without mentioning the house sparrow. House sparrows were introduced from Europe and will fight with native birds for nest cavities. The natives may not only lose a chance to nest, but sometimes they lose their lives in the battle. The house sparrows may also destroy eggs or kill nestlings. You must learn about and deploy countermeasures to discourage house sparrows. Without house sparrow controls, it's better to not provide nest boxes at all than to expose native birds to the fatalities or nest failures from house sparrows. Pet cats are one of the most significant threats to native birds and their babies. Keeping cats indoors keeps them from killing birds and other native wildlife. Indoor pet cats are also protected from traffic, disease, from other cats, dogs, and wild predators. Water is important for birds. For this western bluebird, there's nothing like a good bath. Bird needs water to bathe, even when it's cold because they need clean feathers to stay warm. 
American goldfinches get thirsty from eating dry seeds so often. A dripper in your bird bath will help attract the birds. There's a lot more to gardening for birds than cultivating plants that directly attract them. If your garden attracts high numbers of insects of all kinds, the birds will come too. This is because insects are crucial for bird diversity and numbers. The plants in your garden attract both pollinating insects and other invertebrates. Another way to encourage this diversity is to make brush piles. Insects and other tiny creatures use them as shelter, as safe places to pupate or to lay eggs. Dead logs provide similar benefits. This dazzling cuckoo wasp is looking for the nest of another bee or wasp where she will lay an egg. This male mason bee is the progeny of our efforts to raise mason bees. We have a bee block with nesting tubes and the bees are excellent pollinators for our fruit trees and other plants. We also have a block with smaller holes to encourage other bees, like this leafcutter bee. A yard full of insect activity inevitably leads to a variety of bird activity. The birds will come to eat the insects. While some birds may also eat the same foods as the insects. Insect pollinators allow plants to make more seed and fruit to feed the birds. All of this activity attracts bird hunters, like this cooper's hawk. This diversity benefits other creatures, like these northwestern garter snakes. Now I know you're watching this probably because you're a gardener and you love flowers. So we're going to show off some of our best flower shots.
It took us years of effort to produce a native garden like this. Even if you don't have the space or time for a large native garden, any amount you can commit to will help native insects, native birds, and will add color and variety to your home.